Hey, what's up everybody? It's Leeds, and we're back for some more Thronebreaker, and it's been a little while, but last time, I believe, we took down what appeared to have been a near-impossible encounter, or at least one in which we had a significantly weaker deck than our opponent had, and we somehow made it work. And now we are just looking at our map here, probably heading over to this point of interest here, and just seeing what that's all about. We've learned of a cursed location that we've not yet actually arrived at where supposedly we're going to try to help out some of the local townsfolk who have been sending people to this area but every time they do so they always die so they think it's cursed in some way shape or form not entirely clear on where exactly that place is it might be right here it might be across one of those bridges we were just looking at so let's hop over here and see what the deal is Meve had stopped and was removing packed ice from her mare's fetlocks when Gabor Zigrin approached. The dwarf squatted at the queen's side, glanced about quickly, then started speaking in a barely audible whisper. Your Majesty, I overheard some folk talking in the smithy. Birdies claim there's treasure, true riches, in the hills near Blackbrook Vale, south of here, stowed away there. And nobody dares go looking for it on account of beasts that have made their lairs there. But you've got a wee army behind you. I reckon you could try. Maybe worth the risk, eh? Okay, I, of course, one of the first things I noticed was the title of this encounter, and certainly caught my attention, but it is not without cost, not without risk, at the very least, it would seem. And this, I believe, the Blackbrook Vale may have been the name of the location that I was just alluding to before, if I remember correctly. The queen brushed the snow from her knees, and raising a hand against the glaring sunlight, peered towards the mountains. Though tempted, she had doubts. To start, the rocky scree at their feet warned clearly of avalanches. I shall think on it, she answered, before vaulting into her saddle. Alright, so it seems as though it at least gets that on our radar, on our map, perhaps, as well, but does not necessarily require that we commit right here and now. Alright, well, can we chat it all with the like dwarves here? Holds many secrets. Okay. Discover your head in the mountains. Ooh, ah, ooh, ha, unforgiving winters come. Fear no snow nor icy gale. Fight the frost with mugs of ale. It's good too. Ooh, ooh, ha, ooh, ha, okay, maybe not good enough to continue to listen to it though. Fear no snow nor icy gale. Fight the frost with mugs of ale. Some recruits here. Nice little pickup. And that may have been all. Just do a quick double check here in terms of if we walk past any resources. Were any of these things lootable? Don't believe so. In which case, let's check our map. Our excuse me, our map. Did we uh, learn of any additional points of interest? Now that's still the main quest. I assume. This is the location that we keep on hearing people talk about, but perhaps not. So let us venture forth here, as this was mostly just a heads up of things we might encounter in the future, but not so much something for us to, ooh. Oh, not so much something for us to do right now. We heard a lot of talk about things like avalanches and whatnot, and I wasn't entirely sure how much to read into that. Was that just, oh, everyone talks about that, or is that actually something that, you know, we're going to have to deal with directly? And looking at that and the guards here, perhaps that's going to be our answer. Let's see. We also have something over here. Report, your majesty. Gabor says this is our final refuge where we can rest and enjoy a warm meal before venturing into Black Brook Vale. Okay, so that also answers some of the questions we had before. The soldiers are spent from climbing and need to sit a spell. If your grace could find some extra coin to provide for our stay, then we could improve our morale. 100 coins for improved morale. Now here's the thing. We have, I believe, still numerous shrines that we've not yet used, and, and I don't know, or once we cross through this area that has the avalanche in there, are we not going to be able to turn back at all? This is kind of sending that type of message 
Or will we, once we get to a fast travel location, be able to pop back over whenever we'd like, in which case we still have access to those shrines, and that's a free way to improve our morale. So, I, not definitively knowing the answer to that, but at least going based on what has been the case in the past, I would think we'll still be able to use those shrines we've encountered before, so I think we pass on this one. Because we just don't need to spend coins to improve our morale. Get a little more resources here, and in fact, is there anything that we know of in this area? Oh, no, that's where we uh, had the drinking contest, was it not? Yeah, it was. Okay. No worries. Been there and done that. But it seems we have some big stuff right here. In Blackbrook Vale, you're advised to never stop or stray from the road. Okay, now once again, is that just talk? Or is there actually something behind that? If we dilly-dally stand still, are we actually gonna get a game over or something like that? Well, congratulations, you just got uh, you know, an entire avalanche falling on you. Game over. Don't know. Follow the Four Dwarves Codex. It'll save your life. Um, hey Gabor, do you have one of those things? In Blackbrook Vale. You're advised to never stop or stray from the road. Okay, so here's the thing. You know the first thing we have to do is see if that's going to happen, right? <laughs> I mean, we have to at least check. In the name of science, is that how it works? Okay, also, I totally thought that this was just snow falling down from the mountainside and that that was sort of your hint of, hey, no, they weren't kidding. This is a pretty treacherous place, but no, it's, it's just a waterfall. It's way safer. Way safer. It's not like, you know, you just casually step off the side and... Whoa! Yeah, no, we'll be fine. Probably. Maybe. I also... That'd be so cool if there was something hidden in here. That'd be devious. Well, uh, talk about fast travel spots. There's one right here. So... It does appear as though we can still fast travel back to the other location, so yes, indeed, should still have access to those shrines, so again, I mean, if we really need the high morale, we can go back and use that as well, but no shortage of morale boosts available to us right now. Ooh, what is this? Here we are. Me, maybe walk place? more slowly. Like Brook vale. Looks nothing. beautiful. Aye, and damned dangerous. Keep your arms at the ready. Okay. That's a little unsettling. Are we going to see ambushes? Kind of like what we saw back in Molderwood? Maybe something like that. Do we have any updates on our map? No, we don't. We do not. Tons of warnings. But what will they amount to? Also, what is this thing? Something tells me we're going to interact with this and immediately get our answer for how this stuff can backfire. Is it going to be all these things that tempt us with loot that only turn out to be uh, punishments of some variety? Possibly. Let's see. Letter found. You are now entering Blackbrook Vale. Do not touch anything. Again. Reverse psychology here. <laughs> What is the first thing we're going to... Of course we're going to touch everything, at least in the beginning, until we get uh, seriously punished for it. Now, maybe... I mean, we have seen on some occasions some pretty significant punishments for doing things the wrong way, but we shall see. Do not stray from the path. We are going to stray from the path. Do not spit from the terrace. Don't know if we're able to actually do that, but we can try. And always watch for monsters. That's the thing. I imagine we'll get lots of monsters ambushing us whenever we try to disobey the rules. Or, like... As soon as you finish reading, reading that letter. Surprise! The monsters are here, right on top of you. Also, can we spit from this thing right here? Meave insists on us not going any further. There we go. We have spit. Or... Meave. Meave. <laughs> there we go. Now we spit. Lids, did you actually... Look, I had, had a tissue next to me. It was fine. Didn't actually just spit on the ground. I had a napkin. Okay, so what is the deal here? It's calm. 
way too calm. Okay, I think I see what this is all about. Lids, Meave, stay on the path, otherwise it's way too dangerous. Oh, but as you're on the path, you'll find all these pieces of loot just begging for you to take them. But don't do that. It's far, far too dangerous. Yeah, we're doing it. Saves the game every time. I mean, that's probably always the case when we pick up loot anyway, but we the dwarves of the third Blackbrook Vale expedition have expected or erected this obelisk as proof of our efforts to those who follow in our footsteps. If we do not return, drink to our health and remember our names. Hoo hoo ha. M M M D. Oh, that's the year. Okay. 12, uh, 14 by Human Reckoning. Okay. No further complications, at least not yet. Maybe it's these other, more obvious sources of loot that are trapped? Oh, well, there's a troll, it would appear. I mean, we have to test it. It just, it has to be done. Simply put, maybe it's this guy. Okay, he's technically a puzzle. And very much appears to be blocking the way, sort of. Maybe not to, you know, getting to the main quest, but at least to some additional stuffs over here where you have to imagine there's some good things here, right? So that's definitely going to be something we're going to look to do soon. A little treehouse? That's interesting. Or shrine of some variety. Okay, so we will definitely check that out. Now, this loot too. This also feels like this is totally, absolutely a place where you'd find a hidden chest. In fact, let's check our maps. Our uh, treasure chest maps. Do we have... Now, okay, we've found all the treasure chests we know of. But there could still be some here that are just hidden, not tied directly to a, a map. I was really expecting something here. So, I mean, what better place to hide something than in a place where they said, absolutely do not go here, right? Surely, that's the best place to hide something like that. In these obscure corners where you'd only ever go if you were really pushing the limits. What could possibly go wrong? Right? What could possibly go wrong? So there's the pathway that had the troll, and then there's this pathway here. This looks like there's a little bit of a village here, oddly enough. Still no- okay, this is technically, one would assume the quote-unquote main path, because it does lead us on toward the main quest over here. So I, for that reason, may want to go for the puzzle here first. Also, the puzzle, theoretically, is purely just a matter of us figuring it out and doesn't necessarily require that we use our actual personal deck to do so, because uh, our deck is still pretty bad. So, honestly, we'll take just about any puzzle we can get at this point, and hopefully, in doing so, get an upgrade of some variety. Now, is this going to be a tough one? It very well could be, but we shall see what the deal is here. It's just a little troll. Surely this frost bridge couldn't be all that bad, right? Let's see. Malcolm's engineers were puzzled why the mighty frost bridge had fallen to ruin. Perhaps an ice blow was to blame? Or a stiff, frigid gale from Mount Carbon? An earthquake, perhaps? No, these are not the cause. The true culprit stood ten feet tall with thick skin and an exceptionally hostile temperament. Oh. Move all units except the bridge troll to the other side of the battlefield. Do not let any unit die. So we need to sneak past the bridge troll, it sounds like. That seems thematically fitting. It is a puzzle. Uh, with, of course, special rules. Just one round. And we will have a custom deck. That's that's probably a good thing. All right, let's see what we're getting ourselves into here. So we need to get everyone to the other side of the board. Move all units except the bridge troll to the other side of the battlefield. Do not let any unit die. They... 
have no ability. They're not playing any cards. So my guess is this bridge troll here is potentially going to deal damage to us, and that's why I was like, how are we going to destroy our own units? This is probably this. Let's see. It's the bridge troll. Every turn of turn start damage. Yeah. Three units on the right by three, two, and one in that order. So three, two, then one, which means we would immediately lose you, so you would die, which we can't have happen. Order. Let a unit cross the bridge. Okay. So one would assume that means we need to have the weakest units cross first, or maybe on a few occasions, if we can control it, damage some of the weak cards by just one power, two power, and they can still just barely sneak through in time. You can also move. We can only do that once. So, I mean, let's look at our cards, right? So move a unit one place to the right. Okay, so that's how we can shuffle, or one way to do it. Force unit to move past the bridge troll. So we can move cards like this. And we can move cards like this. So this doesn't say it, but I assume this resets every turn. Because then we'd have one, t I mean, otherwise it's impossible, right? We have one, two, three, four, five, six cards we need to move. One, two, we can move over like that. That means we have four cards left that need to move. So I assume that means one per turn, basically. So we need to not have this light infantry in this first spot. Because it will get destroyed when it takes three damage. So we either use this order ability on our first turn and move it into this row where I believe that means it won't take damage. And I don't think it matters too much from there. And then is it basically just a matter of doing the math of min-maxing how much damage each individual card can take before it would need to move or cross? I mean, that feels like the answer. It feels like it's almost purely arithmetic here. And so, I mean, we could just move you immediately, but I'm getting the feeling that we need to use this. So let's do that, because this is a big six power unit, so it can definitely take the three damage here. So we go one, two, three. You take three damage, you're fine. You take two damage, you're fine. You take one damage, you're fine. So what I think that means is, I mean, you're gonna, on our next turn, you would get destroyed. But I think we can, if we move you one spot, then you'll be fine. So I think what we do is we're gonna let you take damage. We're gonna have you move. But is that via the command? Or is that via the bridge troll's ability? I'm not really sure. Um, yeah. I mean, you are one of the higher power cards, but the problem is you're gonna be taking a lot. Whoever is in the rightmost spots in jet, or the further you are, rather, the further you are to the left, I should say, the further you are to the left, the more damage you are likely to take, which is why this absolutely needed to get moved. We're kind of okay with this for at least the very early stages. And although, the, although these guys are weaker, since they're all the way on the rights, it's gonna be a while until they start taking damage, so at least for now that's okay, but trying to anticipate, so three damage, two damage, one damage. That means you guys are both, or you would be in removal range next turn. I mean, there's a chance that this just has many ways through and, and that you don't need to perfectly min-max it, but I don't know. We'll see. I think that means we can wait for you. That means one of you two is going to need to move, so either you might be going. Yeah. I think you're probably going. Okay. And then... What I don't understand fully is... Does this work? 
every turn. And if so, I think you're actually the most important card to move. I don't know. We need to have this be, well, I don't know. We'll see. Let's see how this works. Yeah, that is as expected. Okay, pass. Okay, so yes, we get this back every turn. So you need to either move to the right or get moved over to the other side, otherwise you're gonna die. You can take the hit. You have to stay in this spot and you can survive for one more turn. So I think that unless we, ooh, okay. Okay, so we can't move any of these guys, otherwise you'll die. So that might mean this is the turn that you go over. We move you, we move you to the right and move you over. You're safe. You're safe, you're safe, you're safe, but then everyone here needs to go. Right? On our next turn. And that's not a recipe for success. So yeah, we probably didn't want to send you over or you know, one of these guys over because they may have been more durable than we gave them credit for. Yeah. We, or we could, we move you one, send you. That's still fine, right? You survive by one. You survive by one. You're gone. You're safe. I think that works. Right? Move you at one place to right. We do this for you. We send you. End turn. Now, both these guys need to go, so it's actually one of you goes like that, and one of you goes like this, and then next turn is just the bridge troll on you. That was really easy. Because we did it with two cards to spare, so I'm pretty sure there are probably multiple ways to do that. But uh, we have defeated the troll, I suppose. Uh, nothing to the loot directly off it, it seems, but there's definitely some more stuff here, including what appears to be a shrine, which we don't really need at the moment, so we, unless we want to get time around later on, but loot the other stuff. This looks like a more dramatic piece of loot, although it is what appears to be functionally the same as other pieces of loot. I'm curious to see if there's anything like hidden just here, because once again, still feels like that would be the case. But apparently not. Now, there's definitely something over here, right? There's definitely something over there. No confirmation. How does it show up? Just a point of interest? All right, what could possibly go wrong, right? What could possibly go wrong? Let's see, reports. Mulaney, dwarven bodies litter the cave. Dozens with no visible wounds. Seems they sought shelter. They carried their belongings with them, items that may be of use to us. Mind you, of the three scouts sent, only one has returned. We know not what killed the others. They simply collapsed, as if paralyzed. Okay, well, we can say we have a bad feeling about this place and turn back. Oh my goodness. Look at this. Lose 20 recruits. That is a huge price. Certainly the biggest price we've ever seen from a recruit standpoint, I believe. Get a thousand gold and 80 wood in the process and a card fragment. I mean, you know what that means. That definitely means we have to do it, right? Otherwise, we might not finish this card. We, I'm pretty sure that means we just absolutely cannot finish that card. Fortunately, we have plenty of recruits to spare as we have not spent any on crafting units yet so uh the, of all the resources it is technically our most disposable so you know we'll be fine we'll be fine we get a second component of this one here just one more it seems and we'll finish it off so that is nice yes our recruits are hurting a bit but we do also get up to ten thousand gold which may even be a threshold for some of our more expensive upgrades. Let's take a quick look here. Oh, what? Well, that's not how you do that. <laughs> quick look here, that is. 
gotten everything here, but at the mess tent... I mean, we can definitely afford this. We can more than afford that. But yeah, I thought there was something really big. Like, next soldier's quarters is 10,000. Okay. So we have enough gold. We actually don't have enough wood, though, oddly enough. And we kind of theorized at the beginning of our trip to Mahakam that perhaps wood would be the most scarce of resources. There, I believe, still is a place where we can purchase some for a pretty expensive sum. But if we were absolutely desperate to get this, then we could perhaps get into... Uh, buying range, but maybe with just a little bit of patience, we might be able to save up for that. Now, obviously, we, we don't really want to spend every last cent that we have in case we do find ourselves in need of creating some new units, because otherwise we could, you know, kind of soft lock ourselves there. So, would like to have at least a little bit of a margin. But it seems as though, at this point, we've gotten everything here, unless there's, like, something hiding in this little brush. And we could always go back to that shrine on a later occasion if needed. But we did see there was some other stuff, or at least another area, over here. And that might be some wood that we can pick up as well. And this seems to be the, the main location. Well, that five wood is going to make a huge difference. Okay, all these shrines tend to have more notes. Lads and lassies. If you're reading this, it means the next group of settlers have arrived. So they make one of these shrines every time a new group comes? May ye have more luck than we, the fifth expedition. Okay, we heard what? It was the second or third with the first shrine that we were reading from? Forty dwarves strong just a month past, but we're now only three. Obrin, Prodan, and Sava. Plow and Mystery what killed the rest. Found them one morn in their beds, just dead. Stiff as boards. Sounds like some kind of, I mean, obviously it could be a curse, but perhaps some kind of like sickness or disease that is invisible, and therefore they don't see it, but I mean, the fact that people are just dying with no signs of struggle or anything like that, and seemingly pretty much overnight, expect soon we'll share the same fate. I can just feel it in me bones. Anyhow, we're, we tucked away what's left of our valuables in a grotto east of here. Oh, you don't say. No longer any use to us, but mayhap, it's just what you're looking for. Ooh, hoo ha. All right. Does that give us a, a map? No, it does not. Does it give us anything on our map? No, it does not. There is a notice board here for what, uh, what it's worth. That is also definitely an enemy of some variety. Can we... Take a quick peek over here first. Okay, we learn a fair bit. This battle that we obviously just located. Point of interest here. Point of interest in what appears as though it may be a cave entrance there. Anything else doesn't look like it. Okay. Well, in that case, I mean, the battle is scary in large part because that Rob, it does mean we're going to have to use our own deck, and our own deck is uh, not very strong. So, our odds at succeeding are perhaps not great, but what if we at least take a look, right? We have to at least see how we fare here. Alright, what are we getting ourselves into? The hay cart. Dusted with snow, an abandoned cart stood in the middle of the road, two feet protruding from the back. What had happened here? A murder? An ambush? Meave didn't have to wait long to learn the truth, for in a moment, she heard a, a damning howl behind her. Oh no, okay, this is standard battle. Let's see what this is. Okay, before we start selecting cards here, okay, nothing starting on the board. Every four turns on turn start, haunts highest non-haunted enemy and move it to the other row. I have no idea what that means. Every turn on turn start, damage all haunted units by one. Okay, so is it just functionally like a mark? Can we learn more by right-clicking? No, we can't. Ooh. I mean, based on what we... I mean, we might not be able to get the full picture until something actually gets the status on it, then we might be able to read more about it, but from what we can tell here, 
Every turn, haunted units will get damaged by one, so like bleed or mark in that case. But the whole move a unit to the other row, other or opposite, because those are two very, very different things that uh, sound similar, but that's the difference between having one of our cards move from our melee row to our range row. Very occasionally might be a factor, but on some cases that actually can benefit us with Gascon. If it's opposite row, then that means they might be stealing our cards, and that is a problem. So that's why I would kind of like to know how exactly that works, but fortunately, that component is only every four turns. I mean, the fact that it's haunting the highest non-haunted enemy, to me, makes me feel like they're going to steal our biggest card, and that feels like that's the gimmick. In which case, it's all about not going for a highly boosted card and instead perhaps focusing more on damage, which we could certainly do with our our deck here. Northern Wind gives us a lot of damage. Thunder does as well. Skull does if we wait to play until rounds two or three. This is a three round match, right? I believe it is. The Cavalry, I mean, usually not one of our better cards, but over the course of a long match, it could, would eventually pay off. Not a lot of, well, we have two slingers, I suppose, and what are we looking to acquire? Probably Gascon, I mean, he's risky. If in fact they can steal, then he is the best card for them to steal, because he'd definitely be your highest unit, and it'd be a unit that we would uh, continue to boost further, so we'd like to, if we do get him, save him until the very end of the match as a finisher. Barnabas might not be a bad idea, because, I mean, just getting a trinket could give us additional ways in which to generate value. Damage from Gabor Zygrin, not bad. We could get him. The uh, Xavier and Brainerd combo is still not really all that good ever since we lost Rayla. And, I mean, obviously we can get more damage with the Slingers and don't know how effective Alchemist might be, because this requires a little more information about what kind of cards they're going to play, but I think we'll dump some cavalry here. There is Barnabas. So do we try to see if we can get any more of the heroes here? Oh, we also have Nickers in hand, which we should definitely switch. We do have Isbel, which is... I mean, yes, she is a hero. Yes, she could potentially give us a lot of power, but we also just don't know what to expect in this encounter. So... And she gives us more highly boosted cards, which means if they are going to steal one of our units, we definitely don't want to give them a highly boosted card. So she's a little bit questionable for that reason as well. But let's stick with this for now so we still have some redraws saved up. And hopefully by that point, going into the next rounds, we'll have a much better sense of what we're dealing with here. Remind me, with Valmir Sworn, we've not used this much. Whenever an ally appears, strengthen it by one and give it one armor. Okay. I mean, that does mean if, we're, if they are going to steal, then... They're going to get better at stealing over time. Now, we also don't have great cards to start off with here. So, it probably needs to be Barnabas, because there's nothing to move besides this. There's nothing to set the power of with the Alchemist. And Isabel, I mean, we could could play Isabel proactively, but then they're probably going to immediately steal her. And we, If that is, in fact, the way that that works, and we'd, of course, rather not have them do that. So, let's go Barnabas. Pam, not supposed to be any sport. Okay, we don't have many things on the board, so the horn is not great. Draw and play two Blitz units from our deck. I honestly don't even remember how many Blitz units we have left. And then this Cadaverin. Damage three units by three. If any, if they're already damaged, destroy them instead. That'd be great for just getting rid of cards. But uh, again, nothing really to go after here. I think it kind of has to be Royal Decree. Assuming we have some Blitz, Blitz stuff. And we do with the Cavalry, although that's not going to have anything to mark, which is a little unfortunate. Anything else? thought that Raynard might have been. Raynard is. We'd actually might prefer Raynard to a Cavalry, because this is just not getting in anything from the deploy. I mean, it does mean if we do get Raynard, that's a 10 power unit that they may be able to steal, but we shall see. Oh, I did not even see that the Stray's Bomber is also a Blitz unit. Well, giving a... You mad? Don't shake that! Putting fire on one of their rows is definitely nice, and of 
course, don't really know which one to do it to yet. But, alright, we'll take it. We'll take it. Also, nothing to go with our, nothing to do with our leader ability. Oh, uh, cavalry is the other one we get. And again, nothing for us to... Do we really need to mark our own unit? Really? I don't think we've ever found ourselves in this situation before. Well, technically speaking, if we are forced to damage ourselves, which we are, we might as well damage a weaker card so that we're minimizing the amount of self-damage, in which case it's going to be Barnabas. I was about to say, that seemed like that was just about a best-case scenario for Barnabas, because that was a pretty decent return. But, alas, do we still damage ourselves with it? Maybe we don't. No, we do. We absolutely do. Okay, it's a Night Wraith. Deploy Haunt an enemy for five turns. Whenever it takes damage, boosts up by the amount damaged. Oh. Okay, this is the Haunt. I mean, it's showing up as Mark. But I think it's all... We're, the effects of it are all from this, so... Haunt enemy for five turns whenever it takes damage to itself by the amount of damage. So Haunt itself does not deal damage. Unless you're factoring in this component that's coming from their leader ability, which will damage this card by one every turn. So that means you're going to get boosted by one every turn. Except first turn, that armor is actually going to take the hit and uh, you won't get boosted yet. So we'd like to probably destroy you as quickly as we can here. Which is not necessarily... The easiest thing to do. Oh, if we if we transform a damaged card into a bear, we might lose the status on it. In which case, we might be able to shake off the haunt and or the mark we put on ourselves. Probably haunt is more important to get rid of. It's basically a stronger mark. But this would be four damage, drop you down to a five. One of a great way to damage you. And it looks like uh, Isabel will definitely be a good card here if we can keep her alive long enough for her to work, and Balmy or Sworn should help us make that happen. But still kind of hard pressed on this turn to find a good thing to play, because once again, we have a lot of great things to use toward the end of a round, but not a lot that's great at the beginning. Once you get damaged, we will probably use Martyr and Bear on you, but that's not yet the case. Should we deliberately fast track that and move it with the Slinger? Go one, two, and three, but then we're boosting you up, which we, of course, rather not do. Do we do it on Barnabas? Because we know we're going to take the damage from the, uh, the mark anyway. Maybe. Or Alchemist and just do nothing with it. Because it's not a negative point play. I mean, this is... It's actually not a negative point play because we're going to take this damage anyway. We're just expediting the process if we use the Slinger to move you. And it does give us a little bit of damage and move you into the, the fire row, which is a nice thing to do. I think we do it. So we, we've been forced to damage ourselves on a few occasions here. It's not off to a great start in that way, but if we can get the fire to deal some damage to you, then you should be a card we're able to remove. Okay, ooh, man. So... For three, wait, okay, for a second I thought that was the same thing, it's not. Deploy for three turns on turn start, haunt and damage an enemy by one on the first turn. Then increase the damage by one for each following turn. Yeah, these are all cards we need to get rid of and get rid of fast. So, now, for what it's worth, I mean, we could remove both of them. With Alistair's Thunder, that does feel like that's a little bit overkill. Because, I mean, it does remove two cards and two powerful cards at that. But, this is one of our best damaging cards. So, to just throw it out there right off the bat does still feel a little bit questionable. But... I mean, they get more powerful over time, right? So, the earlier we get rid of them, the, the better. So, I guess we'll still do it, but I don't feel great about it. 
And then the fire might destroy you. If not, then on our next turn, we can go Slinger. And the two damage for that will definitely get rid of you. Yeah, because we know that's going to damage you. You, whenever a Haunt Timer expires, spawn a base copy of self, so you're going to multiply. Unless we get rid of you, because this is the Haunt Timer I assume that you're referring to. So, we can damage you, damage you, and then just move you with the Slinger. Does mean we're missing out on one, dam or one unit to damage and removing things out of the fire row, which I don't love. But hey, it beats... It beats damaging ourselves, right? So that much is nice. And have we learned? It seems like this meant move card to a different row, not steal a card, fortunately. So that's a good sign. But let's go with the slinger, I think. Bigger they are, easier they are to target. And this way we're getting rid of one of their other more dangerous cards. But I mean, that's only the start. So I'm a little nervous here, not knowing what might come next. More of these guys, which... And yeah, we did destroy our own card. That would have potentially been the a option, at least, for Marjoram Bear. Although, to get rid of a haunted unit might not be a bad idea. I'd love if we could see how much time they have left. Like, does that mean they have four more turns here? You're haunted, do they just add haunted to you? Oh, right, no, this, this mark. Oh man, yeah, I forgot that the mark passes over to someone else once it destroys its first target. Yeah, I, oh, this was, this was even worse than I gave it credit for. Um, we'd like to end this round <laughs> pretty soon, to be honest, so that we can not continue to damage our own cards. We are in the lead at the moment. They could, of course, continue to play more cards to pass us, but in general, we found in these battles, the opponent's AI doesn't always do a great job of figuring out how, uh, when to pass and when not to pass. It's like we could martyr and bear, but that's a that's a big commitment. I feel like you know, it is one of our better cards. They clearly have a lot of damage. So what I'd like to do is have them pass kind of early in this round and then just continue to play cards in this round to win and then without spending any of our really big things. And then in round two or more likely three, that's where we actually break out the big stuff and use things like Isbel, who hopefully at that point is a little bit stronger still, and Marjoram Bear, and do have the resilience on Knickers, which is nice. I suppose it's not really a huge factor, because that's permanent resilience. Yeah. Okay. I think that I may have, if anything, just convinced myself of... Just Alchemist is probably our weakest card here. I mean, the potential for it is actually quite big, but... I also don't have a good way to... I mean, yeah, the best option for it is a zero-point play here. So, oh, wait, but we can't target you... Yeah, we... You set you from a six power unit to once again being a six power unit. So I mean, clearly There's it's a weird there. encounter I'm no mage. for many reasons. Far from optimal plays. Oh, what? Deploy refresh all haunts durations, then boost self by three for each haunted unit. Okay, fortunately, it seems like it was definitely the right play to get rid of the haunted cards, or the cards that had the haunted cooldowns and what have you as early as possible, because everything else seems to be building around them. If we weren't forced to damage ourselves, <laughs> we would still be in the lead here, but, uh, I mean, now we could at least weaken you slightly with this other alchemist, if we really wanted to. Uh, getting more units in our graveyard actually does help us to a certain extent. With Skull, Northern Wind. We have one damaged enemy. Wait, did the mark actually go to an enemy that we wanted to have marked? Huh? So are you haunted, but it's not saying that you're haunted, and then you're marked, even though it doesn't say that you're marked? 
because we did destroy one of our own cards with Mark. We knew we had to, but then did it get smart and it should have marked a random enemy, yeah? Shouldn't have stayed on us unless the coding on that is weird and it just assumes that you're never actually going to mark yourself. So uh, I don't know definitively, but I think this is actually haunted even though it doesn't say it. And this is marked and it's a carryover from this initial mark that we had here. Okay, so in that case, I mean, as I was saying, I would like to push pretty aggressively in this round. And the, the mark here, you know, potentially reason that Skull would get stronger, although they don't have many units. It's mostly just a small number of very highly boosted slash high power cards. Cooldown for Elite really comes back on our next turn, which means if we could play two more turns, that'd be great. I mean, the longer we wait before we transform you, perhaps the better, but, you know, when you're on one power would be ideal. Three, four turns, turn start, haunts. Highest non-haunted unit. That's why I think it was you. you. Got haunted, and wait, does it still say four? No, it says three. Okay, so this is, this is a, uh, a timer that is accurate. So, I mean, whatever we play here is suboptimal, unless we play a spell and wait to use our order ability, which might be safe, because it seems like they're generally targeting our high power units, and Isabel is not going to be a high power unit, but would ideally save her for round two or round three, where she's going to be stronger still. So, just aren't a lot of things for uh, Northern Wind or Skull to go after, which also doesn't thrill me very much. Totally should have put you next to a higher power unit as well, so we at least had the option of alchemisting ourselves, but I suppose we can still do this, and that's, that's not a bad option. So... Greetings. That. Is it? I still don't like it, but it is an option. More of these guys, they still don't have the setup. I mean, this is, this is the concerning thing. We've shut down their setup, and they're still outscoring us. I mean, our hand was perhaps a little bit questionable as we are now learning more about their deck and finding out what does and does not work well against these guys, but... Uh, I mean, at least they're row stacking. They're being smart, not going in the row that has the flames. But... Do we... We can? Ooh. Can leader ability, and they have three cards and 11 power. I do like that. I definitely like that. And then maybe, I suppose, we could Martyr and Bear on you. It's a little bit earlier than we'd like to do it, but we, we could make it happen. Let's do it. Because this is decent value, at least. I wish this wasn't marked right now, and then we could try to save up and, uh, well, I mean, probably wouldn't have time to get in another leader ability here, but let's do this. And yes, it does get rid of the status. So it's a 22 power bear that is not haunted. Not haunted now, will become haunted somewhat soon. But is that enough for us to win the round? Because once we've used that, we are now committing pretty darn hard to round one. I really want you to stop playing. <laughs> I really want you to stop playing and allow us to win this round. Because, I mean, at least what else is dealing damage to them? Count it. You got damage. That makes sense. Oh, the this was just from the leader ability. Because now that, that did set up a better northern wind. It's still not great. But it's something. And I'm just not sure we're ever going to see an amazing northern wind here anyway. So... I think we do it. Because that's not bad. And we're... Ideally, I mean, we really don't want to play either of these in in round one. So this is where we really, really want them to pass. Or at least, perhaps, okay, they do. So we'll win round one in that case. That's great. Went a little bit longer than I would have liked in that round. We did play one more card than them, so that could mean that we either don't play anything this round, we dry pass and just go for round three win, and in doing so, that should get us back down to even cards, or we 
could, if we're feeling really ambitious, play some small things. Ah, and, I mean, in multiplayer Gwent, you can try to bleed out their big cards by playing some small things here and, you know, waiting to basically trade one of your small cards from one of their big cards. But I'm, if we're going against an AI, I'm not really sure that's a thing. Strange Infiltrator. Looks like that'd be decent because they've they've had some fairly highly boosted cards. Slinger for movements. I mean, what we'd really like would probably be getting Gascon because there's been a lot of movement here. Gascon's just an eighth. I suppose we've done a lot of movement, but, but they haven't done that much. And with all the Slingers in round one that we could only move one or on one occasion two of our opponents, that was a little painful. So yeah, the Slingers have been kind of tough just from the lack of units to target, so I think this is probably still preferable. And I think I just used all of our redraws, possibly. So, well, I think we will, unless we want to use Xavier as our throwaway. Do we have anything that could use additional charges? Isabel technically can. But that's uh, still not, not great, because any, any value we get from her first order ability is value we're taking away from any subsequent order abilities because she starts back down with a zero point boost once we use this. So uh, Savior plus Isbel really still isn't much of a combo. So I think we're just dry passing here. We do nothing, force them to play something. And Wraith was one of the big cards they used in the previous round. So suppose it's not bad to see them commit one of those here. And yeah, I think we, we are out of redraws, so we were stuck with Savior is the one bad thing. We have a Wraith. We have our leader ability back. And just out of curiosity, what are we looking at from a... Uh, I suppose one reason why we could have justified playing in round two would have been it might have more easily set up a skull. But right now we're looking at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven units in our graveyard so we can damage every unit in a row by seven or potentially more if more get destroyed here do have gabor who can deal 10 damage which when combined with our leader ability would be enough to destroy this wraith and i think based on what we learned in round one getting rid of this thing as early as possible is pretty important so I think we probably do that actually out of curiosity. On their first turn, they did not have anything they could target with their leader ability because he did have a unit, but Nickers has immunity, so he can't get manually targeted. But it seems like they did not use their order ability. They saved it, so it's kind of hoping they were going to be on cooldown for four turns and to be like, haha, we basically shut down your leader ability for half of this round. But alas, it was not the case. So anyways, I digress. Uh, one other thing we want to consider though so we'd like to have something big to play the Infiltrators next to, but I don't think this is it. I think we saw... What was it? The Noon Wraith is probably the card we'll want to put you next to. Yeah. I think so. I think so. Okay, so let's use Gabor. All right. That's no problem. And we're going for damage. Which when combined with leader ability should be enough to shut you down. Okay. Oh, what? That's illegal! Okay, first of all, are we just going to ignore the fact that you were able to mark two cards in the same turn? Um. Yeah, so that was, I think, a bug. Perhaps because they took a turn their previous turn, in which they were not able to mark anything, even though they did have their leader ability available to them. I think. Because uh, that's... That should have been illegal, unless this marks something. No, okay. Yeah, one was from leader ability, one was from this wraith. Okay, we're fine. We're cool. We're cool. Problem is, we really want to get rid of you too, and that's gonna be a difficult thing to do. And also, you still shouldn't have been able to target him, because he had immunity. What the heck? What the heck? I guess technically their leader ability 
just automatically targets our highest non-haunted unit and technically doesn't need to manually target and therefore it circumvented the immunity on Nickers. I'm still not, not totally sure that I agree with the way that that got handled. But anyways, so for what our plan is here, we probably still want to wait to play the infiltrators, I'm thinking. And that means not you guys. We don't have enough targets for the slingers to go after yet, so that's not ideal there. Isabel, the longer we wait, the better she becomes. So I think we're probably waiting to play her, and then we want to... It takes one turn to use her order ability, but... Uh, so we can't play her on our very last turn, but second to last turn, it's probably going to be her. And then... Skull, if we do get other cards destroyed, it does technically make Skull stronger, so... We should probably wait on that, and I think... That means Xavier is just the odd man out here. It doesn't really do anything. It's just a six-power body. So I guess... We'll play him, and it does mean that if they try to haunt more cards, they will haunt him, and we don't care that much about losing him, so I suppose that's not bad. Okay, so, yeah. Do you still want to get rid of you, though, is the thing, because... We're fine with having one or two, ideally just one highly powered card, because then we can use the infiltrators to get powered up based off that. But spawning in multiple cards is not good, because that does not contribute toward the straight infiltrator and still gives them a lot of points. So by destroying you, we shut down you. And the problem with that is... We said, what, seven damage? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven units. So yeah, seven damage from Skull. Gets you down to a five, and then Slinger, Slinger. Two of them would get you down to a one, and that's still too many turns. Hmm. We just don't have the damage. Unless they destroy stuff more quickly. Uh, we kind of want them to destroy... A card, sort of, a little bit, kind of. Yeah, it, it would benefit us more than it would hurt us if they destroyed one of our cards. Oddly enough, so where does that leave us? We don't quite have enough things, enough units to go after to maximize value from the Strain Slinger, but we could just have our third target be you, and it's, it's not like we're damaging ourselves. Although, what if we deliberately damage ourselves because we just established that we want to have cards in our graveyard? Hold on. That might actually be beneficial. One, two, and three with the Slinger. Drops you down to a three at the end of our turn. Which means you're, I think, taking possibly as much as three damage from the Wraith ability here. This damage is every haunted unit, all haunted units. You're definitely getting destroyed on our next turn, before our next turn, if we use the Slinger on you. And you're going to get destroyed no matter what, eventually. So you know what? I I think we do it. Crazy as it sounds, I think it actually is on net beneficial to do it. There he goes. Okay. So yes, this is the card we're going to want to have be the thing that we boost ourselves from. And also, yeah, Isabel's getting much stronger as well from all the damage that we're taking here. So that's another reason why we're kind of okay with taking damage. So Isabel is definitely a big pickup for this round. We just need to make sure that she does not get haunted and immediately destroyed. Because that would be bad. Okay, but this is about to trigger. So that means we do... Uh, do we, do we have enough damage yet? One, two, three... Now it's going to be eight, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that gets you within two. Meaning we could... could use Skull. But... We need Skull plus Slinger. And we don't have enough turns to do that yet. Darn it. 
darn it. Well, I mean, it's still probably the best answer for us nonetheless. Unless we want to deliberately save the Slinger so we can line up some cards next to, or line up cards in the same row and maximize the value out of Skull. Given how we've just established that we can't destroy with Skull, I think we have to go that route. I think we have to go that route. That means we're trying to prioritize you. You... I mean, it's early for this Infiltrator. So it's not ideal. That might still be what we have to do here. Unless we feel like we can play Isabel and sneak by with her not getting destroyed. Do they have any other damage outside of haunt-related things? The thing is that their leader ability, which is coming back in two turns, is going to haunt the highest non-haunted unit, which would be you. That's fine. But if they have any additional sources of haunt, then it will become Isabel, even if she's three power. So, I mean, she's going to be worth more than these guys, probably. So optimizing her is probably more important. I think we do this. Okay, make sure we put it in the right spot. Power the unit to the right. So that means we need you here. As of right now, this is smaller than these guys. Over time, it will get bigger, or is it going to get bigger quickly enough? That I am not sure about. There's another one. Ooh. Ooh. No, I don't... don't like that very much. Okay. So... Now, obviously we don't want to move the Infiltrator, but we could bump you two into this row with this Slinger and then just use the last movement on this horn here because sure we miss out on two damage, but it means we're getting much more value out of our Skull, which is going to be worth an additional eight points rather than an additional two points, so that is on net more beneficial. It's either that now, or it's Infiltrator. And once again, just not really seeing the value out of this right now. So, eh? Do we go for the 11 instead? Because it seems like that might actually be better. At least in the short term. I think we probably do it. I think we probably do it. Okay. Got a tiny little boost on you that made this infiltrator slightly stronger, but it looks like, yeah, it's just all Night Wraiths from here on out. So, we do have other now stronger non-haunted uh, units, which means Isbel is theoretically a little bit safer, but I think it's going to be Slinger now moving you three into this row. Then it's going to be... Uh, Isabel second to last turn, Skull last turn. Ooh, and we do have leader ability here. We might have had that in our previous turn. I might have totally ignored it. I'm not sure. We have two sevens. So that is the best option. We obviously don't want to go after this 11. Otherwise, we're limiting the value from the Infiltrator. So let's do this. And use the Slinger, which is almost enough to destroy those guys. It will be enough to destroy them with a skull. But we can't play this next turn, otherwise we'll never have time to use Isbel, and we definitely want to make sure we have time to use Isbel. Okay. Gets up to... Oh, it actually still gets the boost from Balmir's Horn once it moves back over. Have never seen you. What do you do? Draugr. Resilience? Okay, fortunately you didn't play that in an earlier round. Resilience doesn't really matter in round three. Deploy, decrease the unit's power by 33% if it's haunted, have its power instead. Okay, so if we had any big card, they were going to target it there, and did they go for the... I think they went for the Slinger because it was haunted, even though it might have still been better to target an Infiltrator. 
anyways, fortunately, I think there are enough big unhaunted units that his spell should, theoretically, be relatively safe here. So let's do that. Play her. It's not too late to walk away. And Velmer's Horn makes her at least a little bit safer, and 51 points is, of course, pretty solid as a finisher here. This is her last card, mind you. It's another Draugr, and once again, they go after an Infiltrator. Or, well, I suppose they didn't before, but it's not so bad. And uh, we need 10 points here. We can get 65 from Isbel, and we have a bunch of damage coming soon from Skull as well. So let's do this. And we're going to banish everything. Uh, here. And that's already enough. But now we use Isbel. Get a huge boost in the process. And uh, we actually absolutely crushed these guys. So we'll take it. Not bad at all. All right. Hard to tell at the beginning of that encounter just how tough it was going to be, but eventually, turned out we had a pretty solid win on our hands there. Isabel definitely a big factor in that. What do we have here? A letter. Duh, I believe that was the name of one of the dwarves that had said they were one of the few survivors. We finally arrived. The place was crawling with critters, but we dealt with them in no time. The shanties are run down, but they'll be as good as new before long. Just a darn pity there's no game in the forest. Either way, I've got a good feeling. Six times the charm. Hoo-hoo-ha. Darden. Okay. Hmm. I mean, we've seen, we've learned, they have definitely attempted on many occasions to colonize this area, and the results have very clearly not been great. But I think we've made good progress here. We've made our way through much of the area. I don't know technically what still qualifies as this, what is it, Black Brook Valley area? Like, once we cross this bridge, are we in a totally different section? Or is that technically still a part of the same area? I am not entirely sure. But uh, we took down two encounters here. You know, may have sacrificed 8% of our army to get a, a large sum of coins, but it was it was totally, totally worth it. And uh, they, they, we just won't, we just won't tell people that that's how we got all those gold pieces and wood and what have you. They don't need to know. They don't need to know. But this looks like a good place for us to wrap up here. So thank you all for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. And I'll catch you next time.